Oh, all right. Well, hello, everybody. How you doing? Hi. Um, well, today is first day I get to be the professor. Whoopee. Um, I'm going to be talking to you guys about composting today. So we've been doing some practical stuff out in the field. I've, I've talked to you guys a fair amount about composting. We've done it. Um, but what this presentation is supposed to be is the like theoretical knowledge behind the hands-on of what we've been doing. So uh, if you are interested in earning the certificate at the end of this program, um, the content of this presentation is what you will be tested over um, for the practical tests. So for the practical tests, there's going to be a hands-on version uh, and the like a written test version um, just so that anyone who's having trouble coming to the uh, hands-on demonstrations can still learn the theoreticals and come to the practical test and uh, still get the certificate if they wish so um, when you're studying for the compost practical test uh, the content of this of these slides is what you should focus on. Um, we should have plenty to talk about. You guys always have really good questions. So as always, if anything comes up, you're curious about anything, ask. We'll talk about it. Um, and certainly when I come back down to the island in like, it's like a week and a half now, I think. Yeah, two weeks. Um, we'll have time for more hands-on and practicing compost. So. Does that all sound good? Yeah. Yeah. We can hold it. Cool. Oh, here we go. So generally what we're going to cover today is just a little, a basic intro, intro into compost. Um, I've already spoken to you guys quite a bit about it in person, so I'm not going to take a ton of time on introducing what compost is. Um, if you want to learn more, uh, we can talk about it further. I can direct you to some interesting links uh, and resources. Um, we are going to talk about some of the benefits and drawbacks of uh, composting, um, why you should do it, maybe why you wouldn't want to do it. Um, uh, let's see, should you make compost? Uh, talk about a few different methods, um, but we're really just going to focus on hot composting. Um, there are several kinds of compost uh, that we'll talk briefly about. And if you guys want to learn more about them, I can certainly talk more about that at another time. Um, but for today, we're just going to focus on hot, comp hot composting, uh, which is what we've been practicing. Um, we'll talk about the optimal conditions, um, you know, a few systems, you know, different ways to do it. Um, Everything we talk about today is going to be in accordance with organic uh, standards, organic regulations in the United States. Um, there are different schools of thought on what is appropriate and what counts as hot compost or not. Um, they are close, but they don't all agree. So just to make it simple, I'm going to focus on the organic standards and just present that because it's worked really well for us. And if you ever do want to certify organic, um, this is how you'll have to go about your composting. Um, so what is compost? Uh, compost is the managed decomposition of organic residues to produce a biologically stable material. So, Things that we put into compost, you know, the ingredients, leaves, manure, uh, grass, whatever it might be, you know, they'll naturally break down. Um, that's what nature does. It's been doing it for a long time since before we got here, and it'll keep doing it for a long time after we're gone. Um, what we're doing with compost is trying to speed up the natural processes, basically. We're using what nature naturally wants to do, uh, but focusing it for our own benefit. So we're managing the decomposition uh, of organic residues. So organic residues are uh, green materials, brown materials, manures. We'll go over these a little bit more as we get into it. 
Um, but we're mixing these together in certain ratios so that they will break down more quickly and not waste any nutrients that we might uh, want to add into the soil. And we're trying to produce a biologically stable material. So uh, we've talked about organic matter in previous lessons. Uh, we've talked about uh, humus, hummus. Um, we've just talked about how to get things to that rich black looking soil material, organic matter. Um, so that is a stable material that should not break down quickly. It should slowly release any materials that are attached to it at a chemical level. And it's biologically stable because uh, biology is the basis of pretty much everything we do in farming. Um, for as hard as a farmer works, nature and the life in the soil is working a million times harder. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365, you know, 100, whatever number you want to call it. Um, soil is always active. Uh, there's bacteria, fungi, nematodes, earthworms, uh, microarthropods, arthropods, uh, you know, mi literally millions of different kinds of soil organisms constantly working to cycle nutrients, eat, poop, eat again, poop again, cycling all those nutrients around and around and around. Um, when we compost, we put those nutrients into a stable format so that they won't wash away in the soil. They're not water soluble. Um, but they can be they can be put into a plant accessible form through the actions of biology in the soil. So by using nature, we can uh, move nutrients and fertilizers through our soil uh, to create a stable growing environment. Does that make sense? Any questions over that idea? You were saying just now about the liquids. Um, liquid, um, you mean like when we, uh, yeah, composting you was saying just now? Oh, okay. No. Uh, I wasn't talking, oops, I wasn't talking about liquids just here. Um, I was speaking more to making a uh, solid compost and that nutrients in that compost would not dissolve in liquids very easily. Um, okay, that I understand. Does that make, does that yeah. make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, that's important because we don't want uh, water to flush our nutrients away. You know, we want them to stay where the roots can get at them. Um, Composting is a way to recycle organic materials into useful into a useful agricultural tool. Um, so we can take food waste, grass clippings, uh, manure, uh, dead animals, and instead of just putting them in a corner and allowing them to rot, we can uh, recycle them, mix them with other materials that will break down into a stable biological material. Um, so this compost can be used as a soil conditioner. Uh, it can create you know, pore space, spaces for uh, water and air to enter the soil. Um, it can create, it can be used as a fertilizer. It is nutrient dense. Um, it can be used as a microbial, microbial inoculant. So if our soils are kind of dead, they've been beat up, tilled a lot, a lot of sun on it, a lot of rain, a lot of wind. Uh, there may not be so much uh, microbial activity in it. Um, so compost can be a way to put life back into our soils and that life then cycles nutrients in our soil. So we've covered some of these ideas in past lessons. I'm trying to bring them all together when we talk about compost because they all really apply uh, in one go here. Um, you know, the compost adds a humus, uh, organic matter, you know, a stable material, that rich dark brown, black uh, look to a soil that's humus, um, and can even help control soil borne pathogens or diseases. Um, by putting healthy materials into an ecosystem like the soil, uh, we can create uh, 
conditions where diseases and pathogens can't live. They just do not live in those environments. So the soil is so healthy because of compost that all we can have is a healthy soil environment. Um, benefits of compost. Uh, it's one of the highest quality soil amendments you can get um, in the sense that it's very well balanced. Um, as a slow release of nutrients that do not uh, encourage weeds or pathogens. Um, if you fertilize with a very water, a water soluble nitrogen fertilizer, um, that can encourage weeds to grow because there's so much nitrogen in the system that uh, the plants that are established simply can't absorb it all. Uh, this can mean that there's excess nitrogen that weeds will then use to grow, and weeds are usually really good at growing very fast. Um, so if you use a compost as a fertilizer, it can mean that you encourage slow growth, of, slow healthy growth of the plants that you desire rather than fast, uh, unhealthy, unwanted growth of plants that you don't want around, or weeds, as you'd call them. Um, Improve soil structure. So again, incorporating organic matter um, helps create space in your soil for water and air. Um, also, it allows room for uh, soil biology to function. Um, and the very acts of soil biology being alive uh, create better soil structure. Uh, you remember we talked about macro aggregates, micro aggregates. Do you guys recall these ideas? Yeah. Yes? yes. No? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, so, by incorporating compost, we encourage the aggregation of our soil. Um, by encouraging the aggregates in our soil, we improve the water holding capacity in our soil and the nutrient holding capacity. So, if we have more pores, more space in our soil, we can hold more water. So, water. It's obviously a big deal uh, in Curacao. Uh, you have a lot of it for a few months and then not much of it for many months. So using compost as a way to uh, buffer uh, your water. So if you have not much water for an extended period of time, like the dry season, uh, compost in your soil can hold on to that water and slowly release it when plants need it. Um, if the, if it's the rainy season and you've added compost to your soil, uh, compost acts as a sponge. So it will expand and expand and expand and hold that water in place and slowly release it out rather than water hitting the soil surface and running off, uh, into the ditches and into the sea. So it's a way to kind of smooth out the ups and downs of water availability um, just by having uh, more compost in your soil. Um, and increases soil organic matter, um, essentially what I've just been talking about. It creates more pore space, which allows soil life to live and grow. Um, and that allows more water and air to move through your soil. Uh, like I said, compost is a biological inoculant, so that means it's a concentrated uh, way to put soil life back into your soil. Um, and by having a healthy soil food web and having high levels of beneficial biology in your soil, you're going to reduce crop disease, reduce pathogens. Uh, your crops are going to be healthier and thus less susceptible to disease. So like I just said a little bit ago, if you have a really healthy uh, level of biology in your soil, then it's going to be much more difficult for a disease to grow and spread in your soil. Um, and if your plants have the nutrients they need, like would be available in a compost rich soil or a biologically rich soil, then your plants are now going to be more healthy, which means it's harder for a disease to get a foothold or your plants will be less tasty to a bug. 
um, just because they'll produce different compounds that the bugs won't like or the diseases, the diseases cannot handle. Does that make sense? Any questions there? Okay. So this is um, a picture of the soil food web. Um, I, it may have been shown in previous classes, but it, it is important to the idea of compost that we understand that this is really at the heart of what uh, compost is doing. Um, there's different levels of life in our soil, we could say. They call them, scientifically, they call them trophic levels. Um, think of it as like the food chain. So at the bottom of the food chain, there are, uh, you know, like uh, beetles, you know, bugs, something like that. Uh, the next step up might be, um, oh gosh, well, let's say at the bottom of the food chain, there's plants. Let's do that. Next step up would be rabbits. And then the next step up would be a wolf. And then the next step up might be a human, something like that. So as that is above ground, there is also a food chain or a food web below ground. And the basis of all of it is organic matter. So waste, residue, metabolites from plants, animals, microbes, this is the bottom. This is the bedrock of any healthy uh, food web. By making compost, we are directly impacting this organic matter level right now. So if we add compost to our soil, we improve our plants, we improve the level of fungi and bacteria in our soil, which means that there's more food for arthropods, which birds eat and birds, you know, on and on and on it goes. So what we're doing when we make compost and incorporate it into our soils is improving our whole environment. We're making the bedrock, the base level of our ecosystem healthier which means that the rest of our ecosystem is healthier. Compost also has all these different levels within it. Um, so it has bacteria, it has fungi, nematodes, arthropods. There are different kinds of nematodes. Um, some beneficial, some are not. Uh, protozoa, you know, it's just, it's, it builds on itself. But with every one of these arrows, you guys can see my pointer on the screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So with every one of these arrows, they represent nutrients moving through this web. So fungi and bacteria are eating organic matter. So that means nutrients are moving from the organic matter into the bacteria and the fungi. The next steps are, you know, let's look at the fungi, or let's look at the bacteria, for example. The bacteria are eaten by protozoa, the bacteria are eaten by nematodes, and the bacteria are eaten by arthropods in this example. So every one of these arrows represents nutrients moving from this bacteria into the higher levels of the food web. But Every time that one of these things eats, the protozoa, the nematodes, the arthropods, they poop. You know, just like everything else in the world, they have byproducts. They eat some, they use some of it, incorporate it into their bodies, uh, but the rest of it, they poop out. Yes. And the poop uh, of these, you know, I guess you'd call them animals, but of these life forms um, is very rich in nutrients, just like you know, manure is from cows, sheep, uh, goats, whatever. So too is the poop from these small microorganisms. So this is where nutrients are made available to plants, where these arrows happen. So when bacteria are eaten by protozoa and protozoa poop, the nutrients that were locked up in the bacteria are now available. They're pooped out in a plant available form, a water soluble form. So when we add compost to the soil, we add these different trophic levels, these different chains or links in the chain of our food web, food chains, uh, so that nutrients can now be eaten and pooped out and then available to our plants. This, this is like fundamental why compost is a great, great uh, soil amendment. So 
If anyone has any questions here, please uh, ask away. No? Nope. All right. Uh, the, you have see, I see the roots to the organic matter. Yes. Yeah, it's in the, and the bottom has the organic matter, the plants from the top. Yep. Good. Yeah. So the plants are, the plant roots oh, go yeah. into organic matter. They, they can use it to a certain extent, um, but only a fraction of the nutrients in the organic matter are directly available to these roots. Five. So when the bacteria and fungi start eating this and then they're eating and then eat, 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 that makes nutrients available back here to the roots again. Underground, underground food. Yes, that's exactly it. Okay, I am personally a huge fan of compost, but there are some drawbacks. Uh, it'd be irresponsible not to talk about them. Um, making compost and the methods that we talk about, the hot composting in particular, um, it requires time and management. Um, for those of you that have joined for making a compost pile or flipping a compost pile, uh, you know it takes time, several hours uh, to build a pile, several more to collect the appropriate ingredients. Um, and you need to have some idea of what you're doing. So it's a knowledge intensive practice. Um, to make good compost, you need to have practiced a fair amount and you need to have a good understanding of the ingredients but also the processes that are happening. So you could just throw everything in a bucket, stir it up and come back in a year and it would probably be something approaching uh, soil, um, but you would have lost a lot of your nutrients um, and it would have taken you at least a year to get to that point. Um, so although we speed up the process of decomposition by doing hot composting, we do have to invest time energy and uh, you know our knowledge you know our focus to do it um, there are less time intensive methods to get similar results um, you know the most common one to think of would be using manure on your fields just spreading manure on your field and disking it in you know working it into the soil um, this puts organic matter and nitrogen and other nutrients directly into your soil uh, and is beneficial for your soil. It does help. Um, but it's not as good as compost because you're entering those nutrients into the soil in a way in which, although they are very available to the plants and microorganisms in the soil, they are too available. Um, they can be washed out of the soil very quickly. They're not, they haven't been processed or added to the soil in a sustainable way so that when it comes time for them to be used, uh, they may not be all there. They may have washed away. They may have leached out of the soil. Um, they may not be in a form that is available or as healthy for a plant. You know, some of the processes that happen in the soil are actually just converting uh, a nutrient from one form to another. You know, from like, uh, remember our soil uh, nutrition, um, soil fertility management lectures way back, where we talked about uh, different forms of nitrogen, uh, nitrate, nitrite, and ammonia. So some plants prefer nitrate, uh, some plants prefer nitrate, uh, nitrite, some prefer ammonia. The soil life in the soil converts these forms of nitrogen from one to another depending on the conditions of the soil. When you add compost, you add stable forms of these nutrients to your soil so that the soil does not have to work very hard to convert it to a form that is stable or usable to a plant. When you go through the composting process, it 
converts these nutrients into stable forms that plants or the soil food web can then uh, have access to very easily. Um, it can be difficult to consistently produce high quality compost. Um, I think anyone that's participated in making compost with us uh, at LVV will understand this concept in the sense that um, there's variable ingredients. You know, you're never quite using the same things every time unless you have very reliable uh, sources. Um, the environmental conditions might change, so it might be hotter, it might be wetter, it might be drier, you know, dry season versus wet season. Um, you have to have, you have to be observant. You have to be very responsive to the compost, constantly taking temperatures, measuring the moisture, uh, just observing it uh, continuously so that you can steer it. You know, this is as scientific as we may be able to talk about this, there is an art to it, just like farming. You know, you, we, can, we can talk about the science all we want, but eventually we have to go out there and apply what we know and use our best judgment. And it seems to me that more often than not, that looks more like an art uh, than it does science when you really have to put your hands in the soil and do something. Um, and the management. Oh, Aisha, yeah. Question, uh, compost, um, let's say I put some compost on a tree of mine to make it more um, healthy, or I mean, just for food for it, right? Um, how many times a year are you supposed to do it? Only before fruiting, that's what you, I hear a lot. Okay, it's best to put some vitamin before fruit, the plants is fruiting or once a month or only when before it fruits you give it some compost right right that's a good question um well the nature of compost i, I mean let's see the short answer is one or two times a year but i i could say that um the longer answer is that compost is such a stable fertilizer and the nutrients are released so slowly that if you apply it to the base of the tree or very lightly integrate it into the soil at the base of your tree, those nutrients will very slowly be integrated into the soil where the plant's roots will have access to it or the soil food web at the base of the tree will have access to it and then give it to the plant itself. So, there are certain times where, you know, if you want to apply fertilizers, you know, you gave the example of right before it fruits. Um, if you want to apply a compost fertilizer to a plant to help it fruit, then you probably need to be applying it a couple months before it fruits so that the nutrients have time to work into the soil and the plant has time to integrate it fully into its structure into its metabolism. Um, if you get to a point where the plant is fruiting and doesn't look very good and you want to add fertilizer now, you're probably going to be looking more at a compost tea or a compost extract to get immediate results or a foliar feed. Um, again, in the plant nutrition, uh, Jim Schaefer talked about making uh, simple foliar feeds. Um, now that would be something if you want an immediate response, uh, you would do a tea or an extract or a foliar feed. Uh, adding compost around the base of your plants or to your fields is a long-term fertility strategy. You do it once a year, twice a year, every year, and over time your field will get better and better and better. So rather than degrading your soil by adding soluble nutrients that will slowly leach out and destroy soil structure, Adding compost will, over time, build up your soil structure, make healthier biology, and actually produce better plants year after year. Good? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, how long can you leave the compost when, you, when the compost is ready? How long can it be there without using it? 
Uh, we will talk about this in later slides, okay. but the short answer would be you want to leave it uh, from the time that it finishes to six months. Uh, it's getting better in quality. Um, after six months, it slowly degrades in quality. Um, but it can still last for several years and be a, a reasonable soil amendment. Perfect. Another question there. Uh, yeah, I see that uh, immature compost can be detrimental to crops. How can I um, make sure that the compost is, um, is mature? How do I know that? Let's say if I buy compost from somebody and they bring it, how can I figure out if this is good compost or is there a method to figure it out? Right, right. Um, well, there's a few different ways. I mean, the, I'll touch on this in terms of making your own, own compost. Uh, there's ways to tell when it is finished or mature uh, when you make it yourself. Um, and I'll talk about that in a little while. Um, if you're curious about whether what you're buying is good compost, that gets a little trickier. Um, here in the United States, I would say ask for records. You know, te you know, show me what you did to this compost um, so that I know what's in it, I know how you treated it, I know what I'm getting. In Curacao, I would be doubtful if you're gonna find um, documentation like that. Uh, probably the most practical way to really know if you're buying good compost would be to grow some test plants in it. Um, think of kind of the germination test that we did with seeds way back when. You know, you plant, you plant 10 seeds, nine of them come up, you know, you have 90% germination. So if you know you have good seeds, plant them into this compost, whatever you have, and see what happens. You know, if, if you're planting consistently, plant them all exactly the same, and if they all come up looking good, um, exactly as you would expect with the quality of the seed that you're using, then that means the compost is probably all right. Um, if they come up and they look kind of yellow, kind of sickly, not doing so great, mm, maybe you don't have such great stuff. Um, that would be the lowest tech way. Um, I mean, the other alternative would be doing like lab testing, um, which isn't really realistic for you guys. Um, we do have a soil testing kit there now. I haven't played with it. I'll look at it when I get back and see if it could be used to test compost. Um, but probably the most straightforward way without risking economic, you know, problems would be plant some seeds in it and see what happens. Does that answer that? Yes, thank you. Okay. So, Chris, yeah. By using a microscope to view the life in the, in the can you say it again? I can't. I can't quite. The audio is kind of crappy. I'm sorry. Uh, just by using the microscope to see the uh, the life in the soil, is that possible? Yeah. Yeah. So if you have a microscope, you could check and see uh, what kind of soil life is in it. Uh, whether it's positive or negative, um, you could do a real quick check and just get a, a general idea of how good it is. Um, that may or may not tell you whether it's fully mature, though. Um, there are ways, if, if, you, if you dive into this, if you get deeper into the microscope and using it to identify soil life, you can start to tell whether compost is mature or not, or whether it's good or not, based on the different uh, the different kinds of food or the different kinds of life that you see. So, an example would be if you see only bacteria, no fungi, no protozoa, no nematodes, nothing else. That would be an indicator that the compost is not great. Um, it doesn't mean that it's bad, 
but it doesn't mean it means that it's probably not great. Um, if you see bacteria and fungi um, and maybe a few protozoa and nematodes, then you can start guessing that your compost is pretty all right. I mean, you can go deeper into this and start counting, like literally counting how many you see of these different kinds of soil life and start developing um, you know, a ratio, compare how many bacteria versus how many fungi. Um, but that gets much more involved and takes a lot more time. Um, if, if you want a quick glance to see whether it's worth a damn or not, you could use a microscope, but it's only an indication. It's not a guarantee. Other questions? Okay. Um, just to kind of round it off, um, immature compost can be detrimental to crops. What we've just been talking about, you know, if um, there could be pathogens, you know, there could be weed seeds. Um, you know, if the heating process is not done appropriately, um, there could be human pathogens, E. coli, salmonella, things that cause people to get sick. Uh, could still be in the compost. Uh, there could be pathogens for your plants. If you compost a bunch of papaya that are sick with the bunching top virus and you mess up the compost and you don't do it appropriately, then there's a pretty good chance that that virus will survive. And if you apply that compost back to a papaya tree, then you could be spreading the virus directly to the tree again. So it's important to you know, follow the heat regulations, not only for that, but also to destroy weed seeds. Um, if the pile doesn't get hot enough for long enough, then uh, weed seeds can still germinate, they can still grow. So if you compost a bunch of weeds that have a lot of seeds on them, um, but you mess it up, you don't do it right, you apply that compost to your field, well now you've just seeded, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of weeds all over your field. So uh, there is risk in making your own compost if you don't do it well. Um, and if your compost isn't, if it hasn't finished breaking down, if there's still uh, decomposition happening, and I, we'll talk about this in just a few slides, what, what would be indicators of that. Um, but if decomposition is still happening, um, if you add it into your soil, then the you know, bacteria, fungi, nematodes, whatever it might be, are going to be growing so fast, trying to consume those extra nutrients that are not broken down yet, that they will take nutrients from the soil. They will take nutrients from the plants around them. They will hoard nutrients, kind of store them up and use them for the decomposition process. Um, once that process is over, then all of those nutrients become available to the plants and you have a very good fertilizer. But in the short term, it can, we can say immobilize or um, like lock up nutrients so that plants and other biology cannot use them. So a danger of immature compost. We get on this slide. Does that all make sense? Okay. Um, so when you're making compost, you need to kind of decide what your goals are and what resources you have available. You know, do you want to spread it on your field? Do you want it for a potting mix? Are you going to use it as a fertilizer? Are you going to use it for a compost tea? Um, your goal, I mean, do you want to spend a lot of time doing it or do you not you know do you have a lot of organic residues available you know the running do you have to run to 20 different grocery stores to get enough organic materials or um do you just have rotting fruits uh, in your backyard from an old crop or do you have to go to one grocery store to gather up enough um, do you have the space available for the materials and the composting do you have the equipment do you really know how to do it? The knowledge and the focus is what I'm supposed to give you. But 
considering all these things is very important before you decide to take on composting in a serious way. I mean, you should try it, play around with it. That's good. Um, you learn by experimenting. I have learned more from failures than I have from successes. But it's important to be honest with yourself and understand what your goals really are. If you want to make a compost tea uh, from your compost, then it is really important to make sure that you are doing everything as well as you possibly can. Um, compost teas are a concentrated form of compost, which is already a concentrated you know, form of nutrients and biology. So if you make a compost pile, but it has you know, sal salmonella on it or E. coli, and you spray that, you make a compost tea out of that and spray that onto your plants. Now you have infected all of your plants with a human pathogen and you're about to get a lot of people very sick. Now, if you were to take that same compost with a little bit of E. coli or salmonella in it, but you spread it on your field or till it into your soil, the chances of you getting people sick is much lower. Um, because you are not encouraging the spread of that E. coli, you're putting it into an environment that it doesn't naturally want to survive in. You know, if you have aerated soil with the biology you're adding into it um, with the compost, it, more than likely that E. coli is going to die or go dormant before it could possibly infect a human. So if you want to make okay compost, you don't have a lot of time, but you want to make it, and your goal is to spread it onto your field, maybe work it into your raised beds, that's fine. You know, you're still doing some good for your soil. But if you want to make a compost tea, uh, it's very, very important to keep really good records, um, you know, follow the heating regulations, which we'll go over here in a little bit, um, balance your ingredients, source good ingredients, make sure that if you do source things that might have human pathogens on them, like food waste, kitchen scraps, um, that you are following the regulations. So this is kind of just something that you need to think about um, as you're composting. You know, I would encourage any and all of you to just try it. You know, just go for it based on what we talk about, but based on what we've done, you should try it. It's not really that hard to do it. Um, but if you're going to apply it in a compost tea or try to sell it, for example, um, then you need to make sure that you're doing as well as you possibly can. Okay, so. For today, I want to focus on hot composting. That's thermal aerobic composting, this top one here. Um, that's most of what we've worked on so far. And there are many, many other ways to compost. You, know, you guys do Bukashi down there uh, using effective microbes. Um, that is a form of composting. Um, Vermicomposting, using worms to break down food scraps or manure or you know wood shavings, whatever it might be. That is another perfectly valid and actually really good version of composting. Um, static compost, which is you know, passive or cold composting, um, is a low management. <laughs> Uh, technique of composting. So if you don't want to spend any time or energy composting, then throwing everything in a pile and forgetting about it for a year might be a really good way of composting for you. Um, you may not end up with the highest quality uh, product, but you invest very little time or energy into the activity. So again, you have to kind of consider what your goal is. Uh, through composting. Um, all, all of these methods, and there are many more, have their pros and cons. They all work, um, but they need to be understood that none of them 
are 100% the best way to compost. Um, I like hot composting because it gets a high quality material very fast that can be used in a lot of different ways, um, but it does take time and energy. Um, for my composting, it's kind of a set it and forget it. You know, you add uh, some materials every other day, you know, every week, whatever it might be, and just let the worms be worms. You know, how hard is that, you know? Static compost, you just, you actually make a pile and walk away and you come back after, you know, a year or two. Uh, Bokashi, you know, maybe you have to buy some effective microbes or you have some inoculant left over from a old pile. You know, you need your container or you need your methods to do it, um, but it comes out with a, you know, a benefit, something that works. So uh, it's just kind of what are you prepared to do and what is your goal from investing the time and energy you're willing to invest? So for the rest of the lesson, I want to focus mainly on hot composting. If there's other questions uh, about how what we're talking about relates to Bokashi or vermicomposting or any other method that you might want to ask about, that's fine. We can talk about it. Um, but mainly what I'm going to focus on is hot composting, uh, thermal aerobic composting. Um, this is what the USDA, you know, United States Department of Agriculture uh, defines in its organic standards. This is one of its primary uh, composting methods that it talks about. Um, so I want to arm you guys with the information to adhere to those standards if you want. Um, speaking not from a USDA technical <laughs> standpoint, there's wiggle room. You know, these are not super hard and fast rules. Like some of them are more important than others, but you can kind of bend the rules here and there. Um, and we can talk about that. Um, but what I've listed and what I'll try to stick to are mainly what the USDA certifications say is necessary for composting, organic compost. Um, so thermal aerobic composting. So thermal means heat or hot. Chris, Chris before we start, can we take um, the 50 minutes before we start the next topic? Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah. Okay. Yep, 10 minutes, guys. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, like I said before break, um, there's many kinds of composting. Uh, but what I'm going to focus on and what you'll be tested over later is hot compost or thermal aerobic composting. So what that means is that we use heat and oxygen to speed the decomposition process. So what we create is an optimal environment for microorganisms. Um, the heat that actually is generated by hot composting is generated by uh, billions, trillions, you know, uncountable numbers of microorganisms in the compost pile, uh, speeding up the decomposition of the organic materials. Um, so this method of composting takes uh, two to six months, uh, depending on your management practices. So in Curacao, uh, I've noticed things move a lot faster, um, you know, double or triple the speed. So composting down there in the maturing process would probably take closer to two months or three months. Whereas up here, especially right now in the middle of winter, you know, it'd be probably six months, maybe a little bit longer before we had a finished or mature compost. Um, now, this might present a problem in the amount of time that it takes to 
you know, make compost. And you guys, I remember when I first started talking about, you know, several months of waiting time to make compost, just the eyes got big and, oh my gosh, that long, oh geez. Um, but what really remedies this is having a batch system. So having uh, multiple piles uh, composting at once so that uh, as you're starting one, you know, another one might be halfway done and a third one might be finishing. Um, that way you have a constant supply of fresh compost that is mature and done um, so that you don't have to make it all at once uh, and you have a constant supply. Now this takes obviously a little bit more management and you have to be out there checking your piles and maybe flipping them. Uh, but it does mean that you get to have high quality compost on a consistent basis. So making compost like this uh, means that you have to maintain the pile under optimal conditions. So uh, under conditions that soil life can thrive very well then. Um, you know, oxygen, moisture, um, nutrients, all of these things need to be taken into account, temperature, to make sure that you have a high quality product at the end. So we'll go through these conditions and just, if you have any questions, we can stop and talk about it. So oxygen, um, most living things we know of need oxygen to survive, almost all of them actually. Um, so in a compost pile, the biology, uh, you know, bacteria, fungi, whatever, needs a concentration of about 5% oxygen um, so that they can breathe. You know, they, everything in a compost pile is breathing just, as, just like you and me. The difference being that humans need about 20% oxygen. You know, our environment around us, the air we breathe, is somewhere about 20% oxygen. Um, it's actually made up of mostly nitrogen and a bunch of other gases. Um, so the overall concentration for humans is 20%. Inside of a compost pile, it needs to be at least 5%. Um, you can go slightly lower if you, I mean, you don't want to, but you can go slightly lower if you mess it up or your materials are off or you get too hot you know there's a million reasons why it might not be exactly five percent or above um, but that's kind of a good um, idea of where you need to be you know this is obviously a little difficult to try to measure um, but there are other indicators to tell you whether you have the appropriate uh, oxygen concentration or not um, you know smell is an indicator for example and we will talk about that here in a little bit um, <coughs> moisture is important. Um, everything needs water to live that we know of. Um, and the compost pile needs to be between 40% and 60% uh, moisture sa saturated. Now we've, we've done these hand squeeze tests uh, before. And I think, let's see, do I have, I think I'd talk about it. I talk about it in a later slide, exactly the procedure, but it's the idea that you take a piece of your compost pile and squeeze it in your hand at a consistent pressure. You know, you're not like strong manning it, trying to squeeze the crap out of it, but you're not treating it like a bird and trying to not suffocate it. You want a firm squeeze, and depending on how much moisture comes out of your squeezed hand, will give you an indication of what percent moisture is in your pile. Um, so 50% is kind of the middle of the road uh, where you'd like to see it. 60% also good, but you don't want it much more than that because if you have more water than that, you start displacing oxygen. You start making it very hard for oxygen to move through the pile and be available to things that need it in the pile. Um, forty percent uh, moisture uh, concentration is okay, but getting a little dry. Now things are thirsty. You know they can still get a drink, but 
they're starting to run low on the amount of water that they have access to. Um, below 40% and things get dry. Um, things don't have the level of water necessary to function. Um, it's like if you're out in the sun all day and didn't drink any water. You're still alive. You're, you're technically alive, but you're not doing so hot. Uh, you need some water before you dry out too much more. So, you know, 60% uh, water concentration you could think of as you're standing in a rainstorm. <laughs> you know, you are fine, you're alive, but it's a little too much water than what you'd like. Um, just to kind of think about it in comparison. And like I said, we'll talk a little bit more about the hand squeeze test in just a few slides. Um, the optimal conditions as far as carbon to nitrogen ratios. Uh, do you guys remember me talking about carbon to nitrogen ratios or in other lessons, do you recall this? Yeah. Yes, anyone want to stab at explaining it real quick? What the carbon nitrogen ratio? Yeah. Um, for every piece of um, for every molecule of nitrogen, you need to have thirty molecules, twenty five molecules of uh, carbon. Uh, yes, that's correct. Why? Um, because um, nitrogen will be bound bound to the carbon. If it's too much nitrogen, then it'll burn the carbon. Yep. Yep. That's pretty much it. That's the that's the in the nutshell version. Um, all life on Earth, as far as we know, uh, uses carbon and nitrogen uh, to live. Specifically, carbon, a lot of it, um, and they need smaller amounts of nitrogen to be alive. Um, so, the ratio you mentioned, Roel, is correct. Yeah, twenty-five to thirty pieces of carbon to every one piece of nitrogen. Um, it ends up that this is similar to what our bodies are composed of. We're a little, we're a little lower in the ratio, but it's very similar. Um, the 25 to 30 pieces of carbon for one piece of nitrogen is what you're aiming for when you're trying to balance your uh, ingredients in your pile. Um, that's what you want to end up with because that will give you a healthy decomposition. If you have too much nitrogen, you know, you have, you know, 10 pieces of carbon for every one piece of nitrogen, you're gonna get a very fast decomposition, uh, probably too fast. It will require a lot of management um, and you'll lose uh, nutrients uh, through the decomposition process. It won't decompose in a healthy way. On the flip side, if you have too much carbon, you know, 100 pieces of carbon to one piece of nitrogen, your decomposition process is gonna go very slow. It's gonna take a lot of time. It's just not gonna go very fast. So although you may not lose uh, much nutrition through uh, poor decomposition, your decomposition is just gonna take a lot longer. You know, this is where you start taking a year you know, two years to break down materials into something that starts to look like soil. So the carbon to nitrogen ratio, when we start talking about ingredients, is very important uh, for a quality compost. Um, other conditions to consider, uh, the pH of the pile uh, should be somewhere between 6.5 and 8.5. Basically, you don't want it too acidic. You don't want it too basic. Um, think of it as just how would you want your soil to be? Um, you don't want it too acid. Uh, you don't want it too alkaline. Um, this is something that I find is usually not something you have to worry about. Uh, the biology tends to sort itself out uh, unless you're trying to decompose uh, things like citrus or things that are very acid like that, like vinegary, um, you know, limes, lemons, things along those lines, um, then you might have to be more conscious of your pH levels because highly acidic things like limes and lemons can actually kill biology um, and make it very difficult 
for the decomposition process to happen or slow it down at least. So using things that are strongly acidic or strongly basic uh, takes special care. So as you're learning to compost, many people advise against using things like dairy products or citrus because it just adds a complication. Um, as you get more proficient, as you get better at composting, um, these everything can be composted. Anything that was alive once can be composted. Um, it just takes a little bit more effort. So, um, let's see, internal temperature. So, this is kind of sticking with the USDA standards for uh, composting. Um, <clears throat> to kill pathogens and weed seeds, the temperature of the pile needs to be between 56 degrees Celsius and 76 degrees Celsius. Um, we'll get to the length of time. You know, there's different divisions of how hot in that range it needs to be for how long and when we need to flip. I feel like a broken record. We're going to talk about that in later slides. Um, but this is the general range at which pathogens, you know, I talked about, again, like Salmonella, E. coli, um, things like that, they are killed uh, at these temperatures. Weed seeds, any kind of seed is going to be killed at this temperature, made so that it cannot germinate. It will just decompose. Um, so these temperatures are very important to maintain for the safety and quality of your compost. Um, something we haven't talked about much, at least in detail, is the ingredient size. So it's important to have different sizes of different materials. Um, if for the simple fact of, I mean, you've heard me say it many times, diversity is good, but we're trying to create an environment where water and air can move through this pile easily. We don't want it hard for water and air to move around because then we can create anaerobic environments which can breed disease. Anaerobic, of course, means without oxygen. So if we create anaerobic environments, we create environments where we are not doing good composting, we're doing destructive uh, decomposition. So this can be influenced and controlled a lot by the size of the ingredients we use. So by using a combination of small and big pieces, we create a nice mix of things that have very good surface area where bacteria and fungi can eat it from all sides. Um, but we don't want it to be all small pieces so that they pack together and then nothing can move through it. So if we have a big piece, you know, say this is a 50 millimeter piece of wood, but then we have, you know, a dozen little pieces, you know, three millimeter pieces of like leaf all over it. Then we have air and water that can move around the surface, but there's a lot of surface area on those pieces that the bacteria and fungi can attach to it and eat it appropriately. Um, this is, something that I think gets overlooked sometimes because uh, you may just have one kind of ingredient and that's what we got and we're gonna use it. Um, but it's important to use different sizes of different things. I mean, the um, example that comes to mind, practically speaking, is when we were making compost at Julian's place the first time, uh, he had sawdust, uh, which is a great woody material. It's very fine. Um, but I was very cautious to use a lot of it because if we had used many, many buckets of sawdust, then we would have, it would have just packed together, you know, gotten wet, formed a little, you know, uh, just a pocket of wet um, oxygen poor environment where, you know, decomposition would work and uh, diseases could spread and thrive. So, Using different sized ingredients is very important uh, when you make a pile. Um, pile mixture and the size of the pile itself. Um, it's important to, when you're making the pile, to mix the ingredients well. 
Um, you want to make sure that a little bit of everything can touch a little bit of everything else. Uh, it's, you know, if you have a, you know, a big chunk of high carbon materials over here and a big chunk of high nitrogen materials over here, and they only touched right in the middle, then most of those materials aren't touching each other. They can't mix and do what they naturally want to do in a natural environment. So like we've done uh, making the piles uh, at LVV, uh, they need to be mixed well, just stir it up. Um, and every time we flip a pile, um, it stirs it a little more. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a way to encourage uh, really good decomposition to have well mixed uh, materials and it, it's also important to have a pile that is the appropriate size so it needs to be large enough so that it can maintain enough heat you know if it's a pile you know the size of my head it maybe it'll break down but it's so small it's not going to hold enough heat to get up to that 56 degree threshold that I've talked about. But if there's a pile the size of a car, you know, it's a couple meters tall and three meters long, maybe it's too big. It's so big that it gets too hot in the middle. Oxygen cannot move into the pile uh, and it becomes anaerobic. It gets too hot, it starts smelling bad, now you have upset neighbors, you have poor quality compost, you know, the list goes on. So the pile size that we've kind of, I've kind of told you guys and is a, a good uh, rule of thumb is about a cubic meter is kind of the minimum size you want to start with. Um, if you have, you know, a cubic meter of material, that's especially in curacao that's going to be enough to get the heat that you need without limiting your oxygen uh, into your pile um, technically speaking you can go a little larger than that and you could go a little smaller than that depending on the methods and the ingredients but a cubic meter if you're going to just try it that's a great place to start um, i also find that the cubic meter is easy to do from a like calculation standpoint. You know, you can start to guess like, all right, I have a cubic meter of space I need to make up and I want half of it to be brown material. So that means I need a half cube of, you know, wood chips or leaves or what have you. It just, it, having something like that makes it a lot easier at the beginning of learning to compost uh, to understand what you're doing. Um, as you get better, you can move away from that and start to experiment with what size is appropriate for you and your production methods. That all makes sense? Questions? Okay. So, kind of covered some generalities up to this point. Um, now, I'm going to try to give you guys some very specific details on things to do when making a pile. Um, this is kind of the step by step things to consider of how to make a compost pile. Um, you know, take notes, pay attention. Of course, these uh, slides will be available um, in the student shared folder. I'll send them to Snellio uh, after we're done here. Um, but this is very important information on how to do composting. So, so you need a hmm? um, you need a container. Uh, you need some way to contain the ingredients close to each other so that they can break down quickly. So, some way where they are close and not just like spread out flat on the ground. Um, I mean, obviously they need to be, you know, touching, but um, there's a number of ways you can do this. You know, you can make a, a cage out of like chicken wire or hardware cloth or metal fencing. Um, you could get plastic containers like trash cans uh, and drill holes in them um, to allow aeration. 
Um, you can use palettes. Uh, we have examples of those out of LVV um, to make a little cubic meter um, holding cells for the materials. Um, if you really just don't have much or can't get your hands on anything, you can just make a pile. Um, it's not as effective uh, and it takes a little bit more um, finesse, so to speak. You need to understand what you're doing so that you can make it in the right form. Um, but technically you can just make a pile on the ground and do hot composting that way. Um, the container needs to be able to be covered somehow. Um, that is something that is important. Um, we're trying to control those optimal conditions in the pile. So if we leave it open to the elements, that means that the elements have control over the pile's conditions, we do not. So we need to be able to control the moisture, control the heat, uh, things like that. So we're protecting it from rain, you know, evaporation uh, from the sun or the wind beating down on it. Um, potentially animals, you know, critters, uh, you know, an iguana digging into it uh, and setting up shop in your pile. You know, we need a way to have some control over the conditions in our pile. So here's a few examples um, of some simple ideas. Uh, the one on the top left is pretty much what we're doing at LVV. You know, that it's, you know, about a cubic meter. Um, you know, they went a little extra and, you know, bought the boards and cut the pieces and blah, blah, blah. You know, we wired together some uh, pallets and got the same effect. But, you know, that's kind of the basic, you know, the, the uh, batch system where you can flip it back and forth. Um, straight below that, downward, uh, you know, those are two uh, trash cans that they probably just bought at like Coimans, something like that. And you can see on the fronts of them, you know, right down here, that um, they just drilled a bunch of holes all over it. Um, this is for oxygen and moisture to be able to move in and out of the pile. The last thing you want to do is close these lids and then it's just a sealed environment because it will run out of oxygen very quickly. Um, uh, these containers here, these are uh, do-it-yourself uh, like tumbling bins. So these are, you know, uh, barrels, plastic barrels. And you can just see, it's hard to see it here, but you can just see that there are holes drilled in it all over. And then there are doors cut in with some hinges on it. So this is a way in which you open the door, add all your materials into the container, latch your door closed, and use this handle over here to spin this whole barrel. This is the stirring, mixing action um, that the pile would need. So if you were going to make a compost pile in one of these, you could in theory put all your materials through this uh, hole, lock it up, spin it, let it heat up, take the temperatures, you know, either through this hole or through some of these air holes, take temperatures, um, manage it, you know, all right, it's getting too hot, let's spin it, turn it around, you know, it's getting too dry, add some moisture. This would be a way to make some compost without having to get a pitchfork out or a shovel, basically. Um, and this, over here on the bottom right is an example of just, it's something you can buy. You know, it's probably not something you guys are gonna do, but I wanted you to see it of it's just, this is kind of the container with aeration in it, uh, just sitting there. And if you wanted to pick this up and move it, you could. Um, obviously this is plastic, but you could make this out of fencing, chicken wire, anything. You know. It, it, Creativity is your friend when you're trying to come up with a good composting container. Any questions over these ideas? 
Okay. It's uh, sorry. Um, it's only um, what I'm trying to say. Let's say those barrels and uh, the pallets. Uh, <coughs> uh, I think the pallets can hold much more than the barrels. Is that correct? That's true. Yes. Yeah. These barrels are smaller than a cubic meter. Um, this is a tumbling system, which would actually, it, it gets a little closer to cold composting or passive composting, something that's going to take much longer. Um, but you could get larger barrels, something that does get closer to a cubic meter in size and mimic this idea and then do composting that way you know it it's they're bigger barrels so you'd have to deal with that but these are just some different ideas you know if, if we look at it that way you know these bins down here they might be a little small <coughs> as well they could be big enough maybe not it kind of depends on your environment but you could get a different size trash can or a tote, you know, something like that and apply the same idea as is happening here. Melinda, did you have a question? I thought I saw your hand. No? Okay. Okay. So we're gonna talk about starting materials. Um, so there's three different starting materials. Uh, we've talked about them briefly, but we'll go over them again here. So high nitrogen, um, obviously it's very high in nitrogen. Um, the C to N ratio is about 10 to one. Anything that's in this range of 10 carbons to one nitrogen is a very powerful composting tool. It needs to be used uh, sparingly. You know, most recipes don't use more than 10% of a high nitrogen, maybe 20% if you're really prepared to do some management. Um, we used a, high, a lot of high nitrogen in one of our piles and we were flipping it morning and night or even you know at least once a day, if not twice a day for a little bit there. Um, so these materials uh, include fresh manure, uh, legumes, so like peas and beans, things like that. Um, seeds, uh, meat, uh, dead animals, fish, things like that. Even uh, like um, some seaweeds might bridge into this high nitrogen. Um, I have a few uh, tables in a moment that we can talk about uh, different nitrogen ratios. Um, high nitrogen is usually a bacterial food. Um, it's something that uh, bacteria can digest very easily. Um, it's just, it's a lot of, uh, it's just food that bacteria can actually eat. Uh, when you get into a more carbon rich material, bacteria don't have the enzymes or the ability to break down the material. Um, yes, I shall. So, so let's say uh, leftover food uh, vegetables and fruits. Let's say rotten with a lot of fungus. Is it? It's okay, right? They're gonna be killed anyway, and they eat. Okay. Yeah, yeah. You can definitely use those materials. Um, they would be a green material or a high nitrogen, depending on what they are, and for the specific instance of like household food scraps and doing hot composting. I've actually included an example here in a moment that you can use to do hot composting with food scraps. Um, so high nitrogen is usually the last ingredient you collect because it's very hard to store. Um, it's the kind of thing that if you let it sit around for a day or two, it tends to start smelling um, like manure, or uh, you know, very wet food scraps, things like that. Uh, green materials. So green materials are anything cut when it was green and still contains the sugars, proteins, and carbohydrates. Um, so food scraps, like we talked about, um, 
you know, tree limbs or well, that, well, let's forget that one, uh, you know, weeds, um, grasses, um, anything along those lines. Um, they're high in nitrogen, not as high as the high N, but they have a significant amount of nitrogen. Um, their carbon to nitrogen ratio is between uh, 30 and 60 pieces of carbon for every one piece of nitrogen. Um, so it's close to the balance that it's close to that line that we're trying to find with all of our materials. You know, we want to balance to about 25 or 30 pieces of carbon to one nitrogen. These materials, <coughs> they're not quite perfect, but they're close. Um, if you want to store them for long term while you're kind of waiting for uh, all your materials to be collected, you probably have to dry them out. Otherwise, they're going to start rotting or decomposing. Um, and they may go anaerobic if they're stored wet. Um, you know, they might start smelling or turning into slop, things like that. Um, these materials are decomposable by bacteria and fungi. So, you know, food scraps, you leave them around for a while, they'll get a little mold on them, um, they'll start yellowing, you know, there's some probably some bacteria acting on them. You know, they can be tested by both uh, general decomposers. Um, bacteria tend to focus on nitrogen, uh, fungi tend to focus on carbon. Then we have brown materials. So this is commonly thought of as woody materials. Um, they're really high in carbon. Um, you know, a C to N ratio greater than 60 pieces of carbon to one nitrogen. So this is things like wood chips, sawdust, uh, stalks, maybe like uh, dried sorghum stalks, things like that, um, paper, cardboard, anything high in cellulose or lignin. So cellulose or lignin, uh, they're, think of them as what makes up a lot of trees. You know, what gives trees like their uh, stringy, tough uh, strands. Um, you know, it's just a denser material made with more carbon. Um, and fungi <coughs> tend to be able to break these down more easily. Um, fungi just have the, ability to make compounds that break down carbon chains more easily, they make acids. So think of it in terms of like, like fungi can actually uh, break down rocks. They can make acids that allow them to digest rocks. So bacteria cannot really break down rocks. If at all, uh, they're not very good at it. Um, so fungi are really good at breaking down more dense materials that have more minerals in them. You know, things like uh, carbon dense things would be an example of that. I, I have a question. Yeah. Um, so what would you consider um, leaves on a pipe? Is that uh, grass because they dry completely up, or is that uh, because I don't know. I don't know. if the if the if the leaves uh, dried and fell off the tree, um, then they are brown. Okay. If you cut them off while they're green, then they would be a green material. Okay. Uh, or don't they dry out? Well, if you cut them and then they dry? No. I yes. might have, uh, what do you say? It's like if you cut them um, and then they, they stay for, let's say, a month and then they dry out. Then they become they become brown materials. Yeah, but you showed it yeah. already in the. In the oh, next you, slide. You, you showed it already in the. Next the, slide. The no, one before in the green itself, you could. Uh, uh, yeah, it's it's difficult when you get to this point because yeah, when you have a if you cut down green leaves, they would still have 
you know, a lot of sugars and proteins and carbohydrates, a lot of enzymes in them that would make them a green material. But the longer they are stored, the more that these sugars, proteins, carbs break down and become less usable as a green material. So I think the simplest way to keep this in mind is just if it looks green, it's probably a green. If it doesn't look green, then it's probably a brown. Okay. Um, and if it has some green and some brown, well, then it's a mix between the two. I mean, what makes me think of this is the um, elephant grass that we used um, because the stalks are certainly dense. You know, they have carbon in them for sure, but they're still growing, they are still green. So it, that's kind of a, a mix where like the leaves of the elephant grass, you know, the fresh leaves, those are definitely a green material because they're soft, they're supple, um, you know, they're alive. You know, think of it as something that's freshly alive or freshly dead. Okay. Um, if it's been sitting around for a little while, drying out, dead for a while, the things that make it a green material break down and go away over time. Does that answer the question? Yeah, because I was dealing with the best with dry so but it's okay. I understand. Yeah, I mean, there are some things. This is a spot that honestly has confused me in the past as well because it's if it's not freshly green you know if you don't cut it when it's green and use it then it its nitrogen content starts to drop yeah. and it's kind of a gradient so over time it gets less and less green so to speak so here's kind of the example and it speaks to that a little bit you know, first first thing on the list, dry leaves versus fresh leaves. You know, if you let the leaves dry out, more than likely they're just brown. If they're green and still supple, then they're, you know, green. Um, and the, I mean, color, you know, without getting too deep into it, color is usually a pretty decent indicator of what you're working with. If it looks brown, feels kind of dry, you know, wants to like snap and break apart, it's probably a brown, it's probably high in carbon. If it you know, is alive, supple, looks green, you know, it's probably a green material. It probably has a decent amount of nitrogen in it. Roel? Yeah, I see like uh, you have uh, seaweed and kelp. How fresh do they need to be to be green? Uh, I mean, like straight out of difficult. the water. Yeah, straight from the water. Yeah, I mean, that would be the ideal. Harvest it from the water and use it within a couple of days would be, that way, that way I could see it definitely being a green. And what about the, the, the salt content? Is that uh, something to worry about or? Yes, uh, it would concern me if you were using like a lot of seaweed. Like if your only green material was seaweed, that might concern me. Um, I'm not certain, I mean, the, those plants have evolved to withstand salt concentrations in the ocean. I'm not sure if they have that same salt concentration in their bodies, because they might be able to filter out the salt and keep it outside of them. Um, so I can't give you a good answer on that one. I could look into that. Piece of paper here. Are there any other questions over the green and brown materials, high nitrogen materials, anything like that? Are your coffee grounds, coffee filters, coffee filters? Everything. 
How come I did green? Yeah, paper towels. Why paper towels? I think because they're such a thin material, there's just not much to them, I think is why. Uh, that, that actually is a good question because there's <laughs> probably next to no nitrogen in those paper towels. Um, just because they're so thin, I would imagine that the surface area of the carbon is so accessible, it would break down really, really fast. Good question. Can you use toilet paper? <laughs> Not use, me <anymore. laughs> So, recycling. Here are a couple tables I've, I just pulled off the internet of ratios of <coughs> carbon to nitrogen. So, you know, up here we have aged chicken manure, seven to one. You know, that's not even fresh chicken manure. It's still very strong. You know, food scraps, 17 to one. Vegetable scraps, coffee, grass clippings, fresh weeds, fruit waste, rotting manure. You know, all of these here, seaweed. You know, all of these are in that uh, 20 to 30 to one ratio range, which is really nice. Uh, you know, the brown you know, leaves, this would obviously be dried leaves, I would say. Um, straw and hay, uh, sawdust, 500 to one, you know, that's straight from the tree. Wood chips, 700. Shredded newspaper, you know, nutshells a little lower. Stalks, you know, corn stalks would be comparable to sorghum stalks for sure. You know, over here we have, you know, chicken dung. Yeah, I mean, you, you can dive deep, deep, deep into this, uh, you know, different levels of waste. Slaughter waste. So this is waste left over from slaughtering animals, you know, for you know, beef or, you know, uh, chicken, things like that. Different kinds of manures, you know, horse manure is much higher in uh, carbon than say pig or chicken. You know, we have carrots, potatoes, all these things. So this is something that if you want to go deeper into making compost and really getting a well-balanced compost pile, this is one of those rabbit holes you can go down, so to speak, um, of just balancing materials, balancing that carbon to nitrogen uh, material. What about the rice? Rice. 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 Rice itself? It could have been uh, done fast and you want to throw it in the fire. Uh, rice, I mean, would be certainly lower than this. Um, I would guess maybe 60 to 1. I'm not certain about that. Uh, soybean meal. I mean, for example, soybean meal, soybeans are a legume, so they're high in nitrogen, and soybean meal is ground up soybeans. That's, you know, four to six uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio. Um, you know, rice certainly wouldn't be that strong, but it would be, I would guess, in the, you know, 40s or 50s, something like that. Any other comments or questions here? You have there, you have there, um, on top I see nitrogen percentage, and yeah. then you have carbon slash uh, nitrogen radio. Um, so yeah. you see, let's say chicken dung, eight, nitrogen, and then on the right side you have a carbon, nitrogen, what does that, uh, what does that, okay, the eight, I can understand. What I can read here is nitrogen, yeah. right? And this. Yeah, so, uh, okay. so this number and, is like, if you have one pound of chicken dung. Oh, it has eight percentage nitrogen. 
but okay, I understand that part. But next to it, the six and fifteen. So six dash fifteen is a range. So it could have a range of six to one carbon to nitrogen, or it could have fifteen to one carbon to nitrogen, um, or it could have ten to one carbon to nitrogen. Um, this is just showing the variability within the category of chicken dung. So not all chicken poop is created equal. Um, some might have a lower carbon to nitrogen ratio, some might have higher. So the, this could maybe account for aging it. For so the chicken dung has carbon in it? Uh-huh, yeah. The chicken dung has carbon in it? Yes. Everything, almost everything uh, that has or that grows or comes from a living thing has some level of carbon in it. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. So we need to understand our materials, you know, percentages of our materials. It's about that time, Stanley. You want to go a little more? Let's see. Um, I'll just keep going. Um, so percentages of percentages of our materials. Um, understanding your materials uh, can take practice. Uh, trial and error. Um, you know, you can look at all kinds of graphs, like or uh, tables, like we just did. Um, but in the end, you just kind of need to try it and see what works. So, uh, one way to go about this is to make uh, trial piles. You know, try it out um, at different concentrations. So, if you wanted to experiment uh, with different levels of nitrogen uh, mixed with certain ingredients. You could make, you know, some example piles of like three piles that have 50% green, 50% brown, and then they're the same materials, but you add different amounts of high nitrogen. So maybe you add 10% chicken manure, maybe you add 15% chicken manure, maybe you add 20% chicken manure, and then monitor these experience experiments to for your desired temperatures. So. This is a way to start to understand better, um, I mean, just what you're doing, what you're prepared to do. So if you want, for example, a pile that you do not want to turn very often, you really want to invest as little time as possible into it, you would probably be more interested in a pile that has 10% nitrogen in it. Um, rather than a pile that has 20% high nitrogen in it. A pile that has 20% high nitrogen in it is probably going to require constant attention. You know, checking the temperature two, maybe three times a day, maybe having to turn the pile once or twice a day. Uh, it's a lot of work, but you get a material that's usable much faster. Whereas if you have 10% high nitrogen in a pile, you're going to be checking the pile, you know, probably once a day, um, and you'll probably have to flip it every two to three days, um, and it's just less effort, but it's going to take you longer to get a usable material. So again, it's thinking about what are you prepared for, what do you want to do, how much time do you want to commit, how much do you need this. You know. So measuring and mixing, you know, it use when you're making your compost piles, it's important to use like uniform containers, some way to tell that you're getting the same amount or the same comparable amount of different materials. So buckets, shovels, bags, you can add add materials in layers to a uh, container. So it's all right, we've added 10 centimeters of this material. Now we add 20 centimeters of this material. Whatever you choose to do, 
it's important to remain consistent. Um, otherwise, you're not quite sure what you're going to get in the end. So what we do at the LVV farm is use buckets, you know, the five gallon buckets. Um, they're small scale. They're very appropriate for the scale that we're operating at out there. And it makes it very obvious how much of a percentage we're adding of any given thing. So if we have 10 buckets and we add one bucket of high nitrogen and four buckets of green and six buckets of brown, that means we have 10% high nitrogen, 40% uh, green material and 60% brown. Um, it's just, if you have good tools, uh, ways to monitor or make your pile, um, it makes the whole process much easier to think about. Um, it's important to mix the materials together, as we've talked about before. Uh, we used the mixing bowl method uh, at LVV. We just filled up a container with water, dumped each 10 buckets in, mixed them around, and then shoveled them into the container that we're composting in. Um, that does double duty of uh, adding moisture to the ingredients as well as mixing them very well. Um, you can mix them on a tarp, you know, just a piece of cement, some convenient area, dump them all together, stir them around, and then throw them into the container. Um, you can even use the container you're composting in as the mixing bowl itself. So you can add the ingredients layer by layer, and then every time you turn your pile, you are mixing those ingredients. So it's a way to get away without using an initial mixing bowl, so to speak. Um, but whatever method you use, it's important to mix in with water or soak it with water before you use it or spray water over it as you're adding it. Uh, water is vital. It is absolutely necessary to make a good compost of almost any kind. You need to manage your moisture very well. Um, so whatever method you choose, however you decide to do it, uh, water is important. I personally like the mixing bowl because it does a, several things at once. Um, you mix, you wet, you stir, you toss it in, you're good to go. So. Um, why don't we take another 10 minute break and then I should be able to finish up in the remaining time. Sound good? Yeah. <laughs> so I've talked a little bit about using, I mean, I've talked a lot about using water in our compost and how important it is. The source of water matters, um, where it comes from and more importantly, what's in it. Um, so what you want to use for water is non-chlorinated water. So if you have well water or rainwater um, or even filtered water, those are all great choices. Um, what tends to happen is that municipal water sources, you know, the uh, what, uh, what's it? What's the name of it? Aqua, Aquatech? Aquatech. Aqua Electra. <laughs> Thank you. Still learning, still learning. Aqua Electra. Um, but they use chlorine to sanitize their pipes and make sure that when you turn on the tap, uh, you have clean drinking water that is safe. There's very low levels of chlorine in all the water that comes out of the tap um, on the island. Um, that chlorine is doing its job. It's killing microbial life, bacteria and fungi. So if we use this water to wet our piles, we are adding a very mild uh, microbe killer to our compost, which is 
not what we want. It is the opposite of what we want. We want to encourage life as much as possible. So if we water our piles with chlorine rich water, we are making it harder for the composting process to happen. So if we don't have well water or we don't have rainwater, um, you can use uh, Aqualecta water, um, but there's some things you might want to do to it first. Um, so to remove chlorine, uh, you can filter it through a carbon filter. Um, if it is in fact chlorine and not a different form, uh, you can let water, like chlorine water stand for about 24 hours, maybe let, it depends on the container it's in, but 24 hours is a safe bet. Chlorine actually will off gas. It will uh, turn into a gas and float away into the atmosphere, leaving just uh, pure water in place. Um, if neither of those really work for you, you can also uh, purify, well, purify may not be the word, but you can use compost itself to neutralize the chlorine in water. So if you have a container of water and you just can't wait to start using it, you can put some compost in that water, stir it around until uh, the whole water has turned slightly brown. Um, and that should go a long way towards neutralizing the chlorine in, in that uh, water. The humus, the humic acid in the compost, uh, actually binds the chlorine up and makes it a non-dangerous form to bacteria and fungi. So if you have a little bit of compost already, you can use that to uh, neutralize chlorine in your water. Um, say you don't have any of these things, which is probably pretty realistic for some somebody, somebody down there. Um, if you can't remove the chlorine, uh, you can re-inoculate your pile after watering or while you're watering. Um, so we did this with some of our piles uh, at LVV where we were watering it in with chlorinated water, but we mixed the ingredients together in the chlorinated water, and then took the ingredients, put them into our container, and then once the ingredients were in the container, we took an inoculant and that sprinkled it over our pile, or over our ingredients in that pile. So an inoculant, again, would be a compost that you already have. That would be a good source of an inoculant. If you don't have compost, what we did um, is that we went out into kind of the, not woods, but we went into the surrounding area under big trees and looked for where we could see soil was being formed. You know, under some trees, they drop a lot of leaves. You can tell that the soil is darker there. You can even see fluffy parts where leaves are partially broken down. Um, some are not. You can actually see soil forming. So you can go to a place where you know that the environment is healthy or that soil is functioning in a good way, you know, it's decomposing as you would like to see. And you can take a little bit of that soil and sprinkle it onto your pile. Uh, now this doesn't take much, you know, a, a couple handfuls per layer is pretty much what we were doing uh, on our piles. And it seemed to work out just fine. Uh, I don't, I didn't see any evidence of lack of biology or the ability of things to break down in any of our piles. So either the chlorine was neutralized or we inoculated it just right so that it could keep going. So um, those are multiple ways to go about this. Uh, if you have to use chlorinated water, there are still ways to uh, get around the detrimental effects. Does that make sense? This is kind of a special point. Uh, when you have to be watering the pile, you have to put the inoculant in every time? We did it. No. no. Um, for a couple reasons, no. Uh, 
once the pile is moving along, you know, it's heated up, it's clearly active. There's a dense enough population of biology in that pile that if you're watering it lightly just to moisten it, you're probably not going to apply enough chlorine to kill off the biology. You may slow it down a little bit because it may kill off some of the biology, but as you make your compost, those humic acids, those different organic compounds are going to start uh, being created in your compost pile and they will go uh, towards neutralizing that chlorine. Um, so I would expect that, you know, if you did have a very hot pile, if you were worried about staying at or above temperature and you watered with chlorinated water, um, <coughs> then you might cause some problems. But if your piles were as active as the ones that we saw down there uh, when we were making them when I was there, uh, I don't think we're applying enough chlorine to harm the biology in the pile in a meaningful way. Other questions? Okay. Oops. All right. So I'm going to go through just three recipes real quick. Um, these are kind of examples of things that we've done. Uh, but these may or may not be tested over. I just want you guys to kind of have some ideas of what their piles might look like. Um, I mean, the recipe you choose depends on how fast you want the compost made and how much management you are willing to do. Um, so like I've touched on, if you add a lot of nitrogen, uh, you're going to have to do a lot more management. If you don't add much nitrogen, you have to do a little bit less nitrogen. Um, so small scale pile balanced for fungal and bacterial. This is similar to what we've made in the past down there. 10% um, high nitrogen, 40% green plant materials, and 50% woody materials. So this, in, in my climate up here in the States, this would take six to eight weeks to finish. Um, that means kind of to go to maturity where its temperature is no longer going up and down. Um, in Curacao, likely this will go faster. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly how much faster, but I would expect probably a couple weeks faster just because it's magical down there. Um, a commercial compost recipe. So this is something where they're trying to get rid of a lot of like manure as quickly as possible. Um, or trying to make compost very quickly. You know, they're willing to uh, do more management in exchange for getting a product much faster. So this recipe is, you know, 25% high nitrogen, 30% green material, and 45% brown material. Um, you know, you'll need to check these temperatures at least two times a day, if not three or four times a day, uh, just because there's so much nitrogen and so much activity happening in these piles that the temperature could fluctuate within hours just very, very quickly. Um, so this is probably something that for the scale that we're operating at in Curacao and what we're teaching and working on, you wouldn't want to add this much high nitrogen. Um, we accidentally might have on one of our piles. Um, and as Sinelio and Roland can attest, it's a lot of work. Uh, you're checking it all the time. And when it needs turned, it needs turned. You can't just walk away. Um, so be mindful of your ratios when you're making piles like this. Um, the last one, I thought this was something that a few people had asked about. I wanted to include this and just talk about it for a second. So if you want to make a compost pile for household food waste, um, what you're going to do is gather up your green material and your woody material. And it's going to be a 50-50 mix. And you're going to make a pile. You know, you're going to you know, make your cubic meter. You know, whatever size you're doing, but the cubic meter is the example. So you'll 
gather your household waste, you know, maybe you gather it for two, three, four days, whatever it might be. And then you dig about 30 centimeters into the pile, uh, about 30 centimeters up from the base, uh, 30 centimeters in. You deposit your household waste, which is, again, it counts mostly as a green material, most likely, and then you cover it completely. Whatever you dug out, the materials you dug out to place your materials in, you then put it back over it like a cap. So then you repeat this process, but at a different spot. So you can move, if you have access, it depends on your container, you can move around your container, um, around your pile, uh, adding a bit of household scraps every few days, every week, you know, whatever it might be. But the key is that you want these, con these additions to be at least 30 centimeters from each other in any direction. Top to bottom, left to right, side to side, up, down, through it, whatever. Just make sure that there's about 30 centimeters between each addition. Now, after you add your last addition, you wait about two weeks for everything to kind of mellow out and uh, uh, go through a very rough initial decomposition. Once you've waited about two weeks, you'll add your high nitrogen. So you'll add, you know, 10, 15 percent high nitrogen. It again, it kind of depends on how much management you want to do. But 10 or 15 percent is probably very appropriate for a household uh, compost pile. And then you manage it as normal. Then the adding the high nitrogen is what starts it off. It's the spark that lights the fire, so to speak. So uh, this is a way that if you have a lot of food scraps, but you don't have enough all at once, but you can't really store them in buckets, you can add them to a pile slowly. And then once you have enough, then you can add your nitrogen and off you go. So this is something that I think would help a lot of people kind of start doing home composting, in my opinion. Uh, temperature. So temperature is super important to manage. Um, how often you take the temperature depends on how fast the compost is heating up. Uh, and that's influenced by the recipe that you use. So the tool that is preferred to do this is a one meter long stainless steel thermometer. Um, you know, we have some at LBV that the guys have been using. Uh, some of you probably have experience with this already. Um, if you don't have one of those, it's a specialized pizza, piece of equipment. It costs about a hundred bucks. So it's not the easiest thing to get your hands on. Um, you know, we started doing composting down there with a like candy thermometer or a meat thermometer uh, from uh, Mangusa. Uh, it's like, what? 15, 20 centimeters long, maybe. Um, and it was enough. You know, it, it, it wasn't perfect, but it was a way to start getting an understanding of our piles. So whatever you use, just try to be consistent. Um, try to do it the same every time, just so that whatever method you're doing, it's, it's each reading means something compared to the other readings. If that makes sense. Um, if you're doing a typical pile, you know, the 10, 15 percent high nitrogen, um, you're going to be probably checking it once a day. I usually do it in the morning. It's just kind of part of the morning chores, so to speak. Um, I check it in the same spot in the same way at about the same time every day. Um, this just provides a little bit more consistency because, you know, say you check it in the morning one day, but they check it at three in the afternoon another day, and the pile is sitting in the sun all day. Well, that sun is going to heat up your pile and give you maybe a weird reading. It might not tell you the truth of what's happening in that pile. So, one of the best ways to get an accurate reading is to take three different temperature readings from three different locations, but you're always trying to take a temperature reading in the very center of the pile, wherever that might be. Um, so taking three different readings, 
is just a way to make sure that if you do happen to find a hot spot or a cold spot, that the other two readings will show that and you will have accurate uh, records for your process. Um, for the organic standards and also to help kill uh, dangerous pathogens, uh, the pile needs to be above 56 degrees and below 76 degrees Celsius. Um, and for, uh, I believe it's for organic standards sake, the pile needs to get above 56 degrees C within three to seven days of the start. So within one week of starting a pile, it needs to be getting up to 56 degrees or above. If it doesn't, then that means something's wrong. Um, the ingredients aren't right. There's not enough oxygen, not enough water, something. Maybe the pile isn't big enough, could be anything. Um, but if it's not getting up to temperature within a week, especially, you need to consider what you've added and maybe modify your recipe or your container. Um, it needs to stay in this temperature range between 56 and 76 for 15 days. Um, those days do not have to be absolutely consecutive. There can be a day where it's you know, below 56 degrees, you know, just after a turn, it might get uh, cooled off down to like, you know, 45 degrees C for a day, just because it's recovering. It's, you know, the biology inside is building back up and uh, aggregating heat again. Um, it's very important though, the pile does not go above 76 degrees C. Um, it is destructive to nutrients, it's destructive to microorganisms. This is where you start getting really bad smells. Um, you are damaging your compost and wasting a lot of time and effort if you allow your pile to get above 70 degrees C uh, for almost any amount of time. Um, this can be hard if you use a lot of nitrogen like we have in the past. Uh, it just means that you are turning your pile and taking temperatures a lot more. So here's, here's the magical slide. If you wanna know exactly temperature ranges, how long, how quick to turn, this is, this is your guide right here. So use these temperature ranges as a guide. So if it's between 56 and 60 degrees, you can leave it for three days. Leave that pile untouched for three days between turns. Now you should be taking the temperature every day so that you know that it is in fact staying in that temperature range, but it means that you don't have to flip it for three days as long as it's between that temperature range. Uh, between 61 and 65, that means you're waiting two days to turn it. Uh, 66 and 69, one day. 70 to 72, 12 hours, half a day. And between 73 and 76, you have to turn it right away. Um, it is very hot and about to go into a destructive area. If it's getting up to that range, it's already not so good for some organisms and okay for others. So really you want it to be probably in the 56 to like 65, maybe 70 degree range. Um, but you don't really want it getting it up, getting above 70 because then it gets just a little too hot to handle, so to speak. Um, Above 76 degrees, it becomes destructive and dangerous. You're uh, vaporizing nutrients. Um, nitrogen, for one thing, uh, will start leaving your pile in the form of a gas. Uh, you'll start getting really bad smells. Uh, and any bad smell is an indication that something's wrong with your pile. So one, one fun fact is, oh gosh, what is it? I didn't convert this temperature, 180 degrees Fahrenheit. Let me look this one up real quick. Um, it's 
if your pile gets okay so if your pile gets to like 82 degrees celsius um there's a chance of it lighting on fire spontaneously okay. um it can actually explode if you're not careful um what happens is that up at those temperatures um alcohols and other flammable uh compounds start being created uh by biology in your uh compost or what was formerly compost at that temperature so alcohol can ignite at 82 degrees celsius it can just spontaneously light on fire so if you get your pile up to that hot and it makes these compounds uh your fire your compost your compost can just turn into fire out of nowhere so this is not common um it takes probably effort to try to get your pile this hot or take severe mismanagement to get your pile this hot so as long as you're paying attention to your effort and your work and your compost you really shouldn't have to worry about that um but just constantly take temperatures just manage and observe your piles as you go that would be the key here is there any questions over this part this is pretty important i shall um between 61 celsius and 65 celsius two days between two the two days between two days, then two days. Okay, every two days you need to turn between 61 and 65. Why, yeah? Okay. Good? Yes. Okay. Almost there. So this is an example of a record keeping sheet that you might use to keep records of your pile. So we have, you know, pile started date, um, total weight of the pile at the beginning, um, date from 15 days from the first turn. So the first turn is when it's you know at temperature when the pile gets up to above 56 degrees you know there's a place to tell you all right in theory the pile should be done at about 15 days from now um, pile number just a way to track your pile this is pile one pile three pile six whatever it might be um, and then a place to record your recipe so your nitrogen your brown, your green, you know, write out what it was. And then here is, you know, a place for your dates, you know, on the, you know, it should be probably consecutive days that you're just checking the temps. Um, you know, a simple section to say, all right, we circle this, we, we turned it today. We circle this, we watered it today. We circle both, we did both. Um, a place to record each temperature, you know, three different temps. You make your average temperature here. Oops, excuse me. Crap. No. Oh, God. There we go. Um, moisture readings. Every time you're taking a temperature reading, you're taking a moisture reading, your average moisture. And then a place uh, to write down notes. So um, at LVV, we have a notepad where we're doing basically this, tracking you know, temperatures, moisture, notes, whatever is necessary. So if you're going to do composting for yourself, these are the kinds of things you need to be tracking, especially, you know, Roel, you had that question earlier, like, how do I know if it's good compost? Well, if you ask someone and they show you this and it looks, you know, they followed the rules, then that's a good indicator of it's okay. That's good compost. Um, if you want to sell compost, 
this is probably something you want to be uh, using. Uh, just a couple more slides, almost done here, guys. Moisture, starting moisture should be about 50%. Um, you want to maintain it between 40 and 60% moisture. So the hand squeeze test, talked about this a little bit. Um, you take a handful of materials, something that is representative of the pile, you know, an, an average handful of the pile. Um, probably dig in, you know, a few centimeters into the pile to get a handful of stuff. Uh, squeeze with a medium strength. You're not trying to squeeze the crap out of it, you know, like break your hand squeezing so hard. Um, but you don't want to squeeze very light either. You want a firm squeeze, the key being consistent uh, every time, same pressure every time. Um, if water runs out of your hands, you know, a few, you know, several drops to a stream, that means it's 60% or above, that's okay, but be careful, it might be a little too wet. Uh, you need to be mindful of any smells you might be smelling. Um, if you squeeze it and one or two drops come out of your hand or onto your fingers, it's about 50%. That's good. Um, if moisture coats the inside of your hand but no water leaves your fist, uh, that's about 40%. That's okay, but you're getting a little dry. You may want to add a little bit of water. Um, and if Little to no moisture is noticeable on your hand when you squeeze uh, the material, then you're at 30% or less and you need to add water. Um, there's just not enough moisture in the pile for life to happen as effectively as it should. So this is another key thing. This is very important. Hint, hint, this will be on the test. Um, understanding the squeeze test is a very simple but important measurement tool. Okay. Uh, smells. Uh, so whenever you're managing a pile, there really should be no bad smells. Um, maybe it doesn't smell like roses and daisies, uh, but it shouldn't smell like anything's rotting. I mean, as a human being, huh? Question? No, okay. Um, as a human being, we instinctually know what smells good and what smells bad. You know, there, there's certain smells that are just repulsive and we can't possibly stand to be around them. Uh, rotten eggs, vomit, you know, rotting flesh, you know, things like that. They're just, they drive us away. Um, if a pile ever has any smell like that, uh, something's wrong. Uh, there is something wrong with the pile. Um, if you're not sure of what to do, one of the simplest things to do would be to turn the pile right away. Um, maybe the temperature isn't ready for you to turn, but if there's a bad smell, then the first thing I would guess is that there's a lack of oxygen in the pile. Um, the second thing I would guess is that there's too much water in the pile. Um, and the third thing I would guess is that it's a combination of both of those things. So if you ever have a bad smell, turn your pile and that should introduce uh, air and uh, help moisture drain from your pile and just give it another chance to kind of reset. Um, if you have those bad smells, then that means that nutrients are being lost from your pile. They are turning into gas and leaving your pile into the atmosphere and you are degrading the overall quality of your compost. Like I said before, covers are super important. Um, you want the ability to cover your pile and protect them from the elements. Rain, sun, wind. Um, you don't want it evaporating moisture too fast. You don't want it uh, evaporating, you don't want it getting too wet from rain. 
covering it somehow is important. Um, the cover can be made of something that sheds water, but allows air to pass through it. So a uh, felt or a fabric, something like that is okay. Landscape fabric, like we're using at LVV, that works too. Uh, tarps and plastic covers are okay. They're not ideal because air can't pass through it as easily, um, but they will work. Um, the main point on using a cover is that no matter what it is made of, you want the bottom quarter of the pile to be exposed. Um, do not seal the cover to the ground. You want fresh air to be able to get to the pile. It's very important. Um, if you seal the cover to the ground, then you are uh, suffocating the life in the pile. So allowing fresh air to get to the base of the pile is very important. Uh, turning. Um, for organic regulations, the pile needs to be turned uh, five times when the temperature is above 56 degrees C and it needs to be turned those five times within a 15 day period to meet organic standards. Um, what this basically means is that the pile in total <laughs> needs to be above 56 degrees for 15 days total and it needs to be turned five times. Um, there will be probably short periods where the pile goes below 56 degrees C, uh, you know, just after a turn, it might cool off. Um, so just wait, take the temperature, and from the moment that that temperature goes above 56 degrees C again, you can begin to count days. So they need to be whole days, like a complete 24 hours, um, just so that you know that you are killing the pathogens and weed seeds appropriately. Um, turning can be used to control the temperature. If it's too hot, you can turn it to cool it off. If it's too cold, you can turn it and it might uh, heat the pile back up. Um, you can use it to control moisture, uh, oxygen levels. Uh, ting is one of your primary management tools on a compost pile. Um, if in doubt, if you're not quite sure what to do, something's going wrong, one of the things you can try is turning the pile. Um, so depending on your recipe, you may have to turn it more than five times. Um, you may need to turn it less than five times. Um, the organic standards say that it needs to be turned five times so that every piece of the pile gets exposed to the heat of the center of the pile. And I guess I didn't write it in on this slide, but there is a method for turning the pile. Um, where the top of the pile uh, goes into, when you flip it, you, you put the top, of, top third of the pile into the middle. Uh, the middle goes to the bottom, and the bottom of the pile goes to the top. Um, all of this is in line with trying to make sure that every part of the pile gets exposed to the 56 degrees or above temperature uh, so that any weed, seed, or pathogens can be killed. And finally, a pile is mature or finished when? Um, well, a pile is not finished until the temperature returns to ambient. So that means Whenever you flip the compost, the temperature should not go up by more than 10 degrees C uh, than, out, than the outside temperature. Um, if the temperature rises more than 10 degrees uh, after you turn the pile, then that means it is not mature, it is not finished. That means there is still decomposition happening within that pile. So if you use this compost on plants, it might mean that that composting process will 
start up again in the soil or start up again around the roots of your plants and that will make nutrients unavailable to the plants or potentially start digesting those plants themselves. Um, so it's important to make sure that the pile no longer heats up when you flip it. Um, a mature pile will have a balanced level of each part of the soil food web. Um, it will have a complete food chain, basically. You know, it'll have all the different parts uh, of the food web so that everything can eat and survive appropriately. Um, you know, the pile will improve for, after a pile finishes heating up, it will improve for the next six months because those populations will slowly grow. Some things grow faster than others. Um, so bacteria grow very fast, whereas protozoa take uh, several months to get their populations very high. Um, so for the first six months of a mature pile, it will continue to improve. After six months, uh, certain foods will run out and diversity will start to drop. So in Curacao, it's probably, I mean, ballpark, I'm guessing it's more like four months. Um, it's probably just faster. Um, if you're somewhere in that three to six month range after a pile is mature, you are probably good to go um, for some very nice compost. Um, but when you're maturing a pile or it's sitting waiting to be used, you do want it to uh, maintain about 30% moisture, and you do want to make sure that oxygen is still getting into the pile. So this is as simple as going over the pile, uh, digging in with your hand, uh, smelling the compost, and doing a little squeeze test on your mature compost. And that is the end of my slides. With three minutes left to spare. So uh, any questions on the content? I know we just kind of went through a lot. Um, any questions right now? So a mature compost pile and have no more, um, it will have very high levels of microorganisms in it, um, but they will be in levels appropriate for a uh, soil and okay. not for decomposition. Uh, okay. When it's in, when it's yeah. When it's uh, hot and high in temperature, that means that there's a, a, a very high level of activity of microorganisms in that pile, um, much higher than in normal soil. Uh, but when it's gone back to ambient temperature or the same temperature as the outdoors, uh, that means that the microorganisms are at the same level as uh, a soil would be at which is safe for plants. Okay. Other questions? Um. Okay. So this slideshow is gonna be posted into the student shared folder. I'll put it in there after we finish up here. Um, you know, of course, the recording will be posted to YouTube. Um, the plan right now is that the test for the previous section is going to be on Monday, uh, this coming Monday. Um, so that should give everyone enough time to study and prepare, make sure all the YouTube stuff is up. Um, and then uh, this Wednesday will be, more than likely will be me presenting again. Um, 
I will be starting into the farm management section of the program. This is the final section um, of the content that we're covering in the academic classes. So we're gonna start talking more about financial management, um, task management, writing business plans, um, things more about just managing a farm business. So we'll see how it goes. Um, I'll kind of, I think the next lesson on Wednesday is gonna be kind of an overview and we'll start touching on some of these subjects. And uh, if there's a lot of interest in a certain area, it we're still kind of flexible here. I kind of did that on purpose because I wanted to see what you guys wanted to know. So. Um, Wednesday will likely be an overview of the last few weeks of the course, what we'll be covering, and uh, we'll see what interests you guys the most. So, good? Yeah. Yep. Yes. All right. Well, have a good night, guys. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.